What's going on, everyone? Welcome back as a recap. It's been an amazing experience learning and growing, and we're loving this book so far. So appreciate y'all for joining us and talk, to listen, to share your experiences and chat. And make sure you keep the messages going. Obviously, we're communicating through streaming. So we aren't able to talk to you like you could on a FaceTime or a Zoom or Skype or whatever. But you do have the opportunity to participate through the chats. So please be active uh, and answer any questions or polls that you may see. I'm going to pass it to our lovely host, Miss Ramona, and let's get the show started. All right, welcome back, you guys. So we know this is we're in week three, right? <laughs> we're in week three, and uh, so week one we uh, posted the link to take the IAT test. So that's an implicit bias test through Harvard. So we're going to repost that link again because we're going to have some conversations today about colorism about you know, bodily racism. And so there's a few on there that you may wanna take. So the three that I would recommend, there's one on race, there's one on weapons, and there's one on skin tone. So implicit bias is bred in the home, in the environment, and in society. It reinforces the fear of those who, might, who may even look like us through microaggressions and just fear of the black body. So we're gonna get into that today. So we have to examine how we learn what we fear and acknowledge those fears to dismantle those racist ideas. So we're going to start the discussion off today by asking, where do your fears of negative stereotypes and other groups come from? So you can put some comments in the link and then Tori and Chanel, you guys can respond. Awesome. Oh, here's the link. While we're waiting for um, some people to comment in the chat, I wanted to talk really quickly about, we've been having a lot of debates in the past week with our friends um, about the definition of racism. And we know Kendi's book is full of definitions. And um, I'm kind of on the border of, this is a little overwhelming with all the ins and outs and all the very specific definitions and really appreciating um, the clarity on definitions. But one of the things that we're still struggling with is not everyone agrees of, about the definitions. And so some of my friends still feel that Black people can't be racist. Um, and so we've been going back and forth about that. Obviously we know Kendi's thoughts on it, um, but I'm wondering too, if you guys are having similar struggles with really defining racism, um, because that has been, that's been a struggle for us. And um, the book, especially now we have behavioral racism, um, internalized racism, ethnic racism, what else? There's like a million different versions. And we know that racism is this kind of really in-depth concept and it has a lot of layers to it. So there's, it's a lot to it, but um, I'm still struggling with those conversations around, can black people be racist? Can non-white people be racist? Since we don't have the power to use those prejudice nation in a meaningful way. And so that's been a online debate with me and my friends. So just wanted to point that out. Let's see, where do people learn or gain fears about groups of people? Someone said experiences and learn through family and friends. TV and movies perpetuate stereotypes, it's true. Music, uh, learn from family. Sure. I think someone, uh, one that I think about all the time is some people that has been personal experiences, like things that have happened to you may impact the way you think about a certain group of people. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are, are getting in the same experiences from friends, movies, music, videos, social reinforcement, other white people making jokes or statements. Yeah. Schools and history, learn through family and peers mostly. Yeah, media, family, friends. And typically, who are the groups that you fear? In general, are black the group that's the most feared in your experiences? And you can be completely honest, be completely honest. When you are having these fears about certain groups of people, who do they tend to be? Lack of experiences is a good one too. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm just curious as if anyone can openly say that they, 
that the most feared racial group to them is black people, or maybe it's not black people. That'd be interesting to see if it was someone else. Like that'd be interesting because I think also it's about culture, right? So depending on where you're from, maybe that's not the most feared race. But you know, if you're here in America and you're walking in, you know, downtown Baltimore, downtown South Central Los Angeles, you know, maybe um, down in Brooklyn, in New York, Chicago, who are you going to fear the most? Oh, someone said men in general. Hmm. Okay. I, I, I think in my experiences with people that I know, it's definitely been black men specifically um, more than white men. But I, I agree that men in general get more of a fearful, like a more, more to be feared view. So I'm sorry, Ramona, we're off topic because there's <laughs> a we talked about racism. And I think it's such an important conversation to just quickly go over because we went back and forth and we're like, can Asian people be racist? Can like Indian people be racist? Is it only people who have the majority power and that can use their prejudice and their discrimination? Are they the only ones who can turn over all that race? Because they're the what are your thoughts about that, Ramona? I mean, I think, like I said, I think that everybody can be racist and I think that there isn't a middle ground. So I think that even though we have this discussion quite often too, right? So no matter what race you are, if you say things like, oh, I don't see color, like we talked about this before, right? Or, you know, I, I'm not racist and then they get defensive. Really, if you think about everything that you do and every decision that you make or every policy that you support, are you supporting anything that disenfranchises a group of people, particularly Black people? And if you do, and again, it's not that you're a bad person, but those are racist ideas. And so it's not that you're on the spectrum of being a bad person, but you definitely have to recognize and accept, oh, I have work to do because no group of people should be disenfranchised or treated differently, particularly here in the United States. Right. I agree. I think it's a working, it's, it's I'm, I'm back and forth with that concept. I think um, one of the things I want to do this week is really go back to the history and like, what was the first use of the word racism? Like who coined that, that term? And I looked it up, Chanel. I looked it up for you. <laughs> what did you find? It came back like in the 1800s or something. And it was created kind of to talk about, um, you know, the difference in the difference between people in society. And I found, you know, a, a few different sites that had a few different things, but it was pretty much around the same time, um, around 1800, that they're saying that this term was created to kind of describe the disenfranchisement of, of, of African American or Africans at the time, right, or slaves uh, at the time. So it's really interesting that they, they brought that up. Yeah, that's going to be a evolved, right? It, I think racism has term has been evolving. Um, and so we have to continue just to do our due diligence and research and make try to make sense of things. But let's get into chapter six. Yeah, we will. So we had a quote, <laughs> we had a quote that we kind of skipped over, but I do want to, um, do want to mention it because it's kind of important. It's by Maya Angelou. It says, prejudice is a burden that confuses the past, threatens the future and renders the present inaccessible. So getting into chapter six, Kendi has a quote that says, the black body is the catalyst for unfounded fear. This is the living legacy of racist power, constructing the black race biologically and ethnically and presenting the black body to the world first and foremost as a beast. So what do you think the correlation between crime and race is? Uh, Tori, what, tell me a little bit about your experience with that. I think there are it's a lot to, to speak on, I think. Right being judged by who you are by your appearance in terms of being a threat, in terms of people thinking you're violent, right? Um, I like to go by personal experiences. Simply think, talking like if you, I've been in the elevator, I can, can't tell you how many times I've been in the elevator, seeing someone grab <laughs> their purse a, a little bit closer to them, or they get real nervous, you know, when you're going, they even try to push the button to make sure that you can't get on it. Um, because of, you know, they, don't, they have these preconceived notions that, oh, he may try to rob me or, you know, he, or he may even do worse. anything, even yeah. worse, rape, whatever, right? And mm -hmm. those are fears in society for women. But oftentimes, it's when it's a Black man, it's a different level. 
And yeah. I've been able to, you know, see and experience that on, on so many levels. And, and beyond that, just being followed in stores. You know, that's yeah. happened oh. so many times where people follow you in stores or like asking where you, if you belong into, in this particular place, you know, simply because of what you look like. And, you know, one, it, it does hurt a little bit. You know, I'd be lying if I said that, you know, one, I, I kind of lash out a little bit when it happens. But even as a kid, like, you know, you know that hurts because you know exactly why you're thinking that it's because they don't feel like you belong. And the judgments that have been placed on African American, African Americans, but particularly men, is that we are violent, that we are, and, and society plays a major role in that. Um, mm -hmm. You talk about the media, the movies, the things that are happening. That's what everybody talks about. You know, the villains are typically, you know, dark, right? Um, you talk about literally when the, us in the movies, when a scene changes, it literally gets dark, <laughs> right? It, it's right. All it's just straight judgment in, in so many different ways. And I, I, as much as I love movies and I, I believe that it's entertaining and it's fun, but, and it's one of those things that continues to set us back in the roles that we had to play. Um, we were forced to play these roles. We couldn't be, we were never the superheroes in movies. And so these are all things that society, they, it may sound little, but these things are huge when it comes to forming the way people process things. and even their own bias. I, I have a question then. So how do you distinguish between real experiences? For example, we know that in certain parts of the city, it's high crime, mm -hmm. right? And right. so in certain areas, my thought is to be more on guard, to hold myself tighter because of, the, of what I know about crime in that particular area. Mm -hmm. um, I think the difference is in that situation, I had to really think about that in terms of myself. Like, why is it that when we go to a certain part of Baltimore and you leave the car, I lock the doors immediately and I'm worried about when you're coming back. And I had to start thinking about why I had those thoughts. Um, and obviously, if you know an area is a high crime area, it's kind of smart to be on guard. Um, but right. the problem is people carry those same experiences in any black neighborhood. And so like when I'm in a neighborhood, I used to work in Bowie and I went to work every single day in a black neighborhood. I never once thought about my safety. I left my cars, my doors unlocked. I left, you know, all these things out in my car and didn't think twice about someone robbing me. And so for me, it's not necessarily I'm scared of black people. I just know in certain areas there's higher crime. But you do have some people that will apply that experience to all their experiences with black people. And I think that's when... We get we get into the, the issues um, and not realize like confirmation bias, right? Like if you think that people are going to be more dangerous and violent, and if the depictions on social media and within society are negative, and that black men are violent and black, because I don't think, and you can tell me what you know what what you feel, but I don't think that people fear black women as much as they do black men. What do you think about that, Tori? Um, I think obviously with black men are fear more, but. Um, all the stereotypes that I've heard are black women are angry. So I don't think we're feared. We're more like, oh, she's angry. You know, she's bitter. Yeah, I mean, she's, it depends on who you're talking to. I mean, yeah. when you're when when Karen or someone is out there and you know she feels like you're a threat, you know, whether you're a woman yeah. or a man. Um, so there's definitely you know, a us, heavier there's emphasis. A, there's a heavy fear yeah. when it comes to African American men for sure. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I thought was interesting when he talked about his experiences um, in, black, in, in a Black neighborhood who, you know, obviously there was a lot of crime where he grew up, he even started internalizing all the negative experiences. And, you know, his one, I guess his best friend was really violent and aggressive and, you know, had issues. And he started thinking that was the Black experience, that the Black men or the Black people in his area were just these aggressive, violent people. And he had to really check himself and realize that most of the people who he came in contact with who were black were not like that. So right. just the idea that there's there's uh, bad individuals, if we want to call them, we can't call them bad individuals. We don't know the whole situation, but there are dangerous individuals in every race. It's not a black thing. It's not a white thing. It's not an Asian thing. Um, it's a person thing. And so really trying to disconnect race with these uh, body types, these aggressive animal-like you know, beasts, we have to really try to separate um, 
in our minds that that correlation that we have. And we had that conversation the other day about fatherhood in the black community, like people swearing mm -hmm. down black fathers aren't present. And we sat back and we thought about it and we're like, yes, do we know people whose parents weren't or whose fathers weren't in their life? Yes. We sit there and think we knew a lot of parents, a lot of fathers who were present as well, but sometimes it's easy to focus on the negatives. Yeah. And like you just continue to repeat it and repeat it. But when you think about it, the same way every black individual in that neighborhood isn't violent, you know, uh, and all the different stereotypes, doesn't care about education, doesn't work hard, whatever exists in folks' minds, you know, there are fathers that are present in the black community as well. But I mean, society tells us no. that. It's funny that you say that because Chanel and I had a whole conversation. So here in LA County, we're part of a whole um, breakthrough series collaborative specifically on fatherhood. And I could give you statistic after statistic to show you that black men are involved in their children's lives and they actually have better outcomes as fathers. So there is, you know, um, research, but again, it's not what people believe, it's what they see. So even uh, I see Brandon made a comment that police procedurals and crime shows regularly normalize bending and breaking the rules to get the bad guy. So that kind of segues us a little bit into our next discussion, which it says armed armed bodies, which apparently look armed to fearful officers are about twice as likely to be killed as armed armed white bodies. So we know that that's true, right? Because we have all these recent killings. And even within, I think I was telling Chanel uh, last week that there were over a hundred and 20 at that point, God knows how many now, that have been killed since George Floyd, 120 individuals that have been killed disproportionately, you know, black and brown individuals. So um, I, think that's, I think that's important to note too, because a lot of times the feedback you hear from that type of comment is, well, he was doing something wrong or he was, you know, he was resisting arrest. And I think it's hard for people to believe that your implicit bias or the prejudice that you have, a, you know, what you think you know about a person or what may happen. If I'm looking at Tori and he looks strong and he's black and I'm thinking he may react differently to me. It, mm -hmm. It's hard for people to see that that really plays a factor into these police arrests. Um, and so they're like, it's not about race. He was resisting arrest. That's why it happened. But obviously, like you said, statistics show that black people are two times more, black men are two times as likely to to be killed. And so it's hard for people to, I guess, accept that. Um, but we know how we are. We know when we are on guard and we think that something's going to cause our, you know, cause our family harm or anything that we go on kind of attack mode or defense mode. And so imagine police officers or whoever having those thoughts about black men all the time. It, you can see how it plays out and so well, it's interesting so even with the george floyd i'm going to make a comment tori and then i want you to respond to it so i apologize for that so even with the george floyd death you know they handcuffed him right um you know just recently here uh, my goddaughter's uh cousin also handcuffed him you know when he was already dead right and so it says that you know police officers in general are they fear they have more fear you know when it comes to black men Right. And says black people are apparently responsible for calming the fears of violent cops in a way that women are supposedly responsible for calming the sexual desires of male rapists. If we mm -hmm. don't, then we are blamed for our own assaults and our own deaths. Mm -hmm. So true. That's that's deep. that's deep. It is deep. Right. So do we have to like do we have to be responsible to calm their fears when they're the ones in power and we're the ones that are disenfranchised and vulnerable? Yeah. yeah. I, I have a conversation all the time. Um, I, my group chat with a couple of my best friends was like the bar story. You know, there's a there's a police officer and a soldier and an athlete walking to walking to the building. Like that's how our group chat is literally. And we have conversations about their training and who's in what position and what they're what's acceptable to them. And understanding the training and how as an officer in America, you know, in probably less than six months you can have, they hand you a badge and a gun. Well, my friends in the military says that a lot of the things that officers do, they would be charged for war crimes if they were to do that in battle. Now, I'm not trying to say that policing is that drastic in war, but what I am saying is training and decision-making, if they aren't acceptable when your life is truly on the line, mm -hmm. overseas in foreign territory, and they can't do certain things, yeah. but we're allowed to do it here, it's something that we need to look into. Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. And this whole conversation 
brought me back to my feelings about when there's a mass shooter and typically it's a, it's a white shooter, right? right? And so, well, the statistics show that most of the mass shootings are, I don't know what the percentage is, so let me not make something up. But we don't then walk out of our house thinking white men are just extremely dangerous. And so I think it's interesting that when it's a black person, and I said maybe because the mass shootings don't happen as often and they're not like on the news every single day, on social media every single day, that we kind of just forget it more easily. Right. But when we see black crime, it's like something that's constantly fed to us. And going into the next chapter, which is culture, do we bring some of that on ourselves through our music and through our movies and stuff like that? So I'm interested, but Trey um, is saying that we have a lag and that we should log off and come right back on. Um, so then we can, um, I can give them a prompt. I'll do the quotes. And then we'll have, by that time, you guys should be back, okay? <laughs> See Thank you. Works. So there was a quote by Zora Neale Hurston that says, if you stay silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. If the cause of violent crime is the black body, and if black people are violent demons, then the violent crime levels would be relatively the same no matter where black people live. What are your comments on that while we wait for Tori and Chanel to log back on? We're back. Are we back on? Okay, so we're gonna put up a poll now and it says, does rap music impact how you view black culture? Mm. Is it yes, not at all, or somewhat? So why do the quote? I'm gonna have you guys respond to that yourselves. And the quote is, whoever makes the cultural standard makes the cultural hierarchy. The act of making are we, are we good? <laughs> a cultural standard and hierarchy is what creates cultural racism. To be anti-racist is to reject cultural standards and level cultural differences. Well, this is a debate in our household a lot. <laughs> when you go back to the music question, does rap music or hip hop music impact how people view us? What were what our lyrics are, you know, the content of our rap songs. I think it absolutely impacts the way people view us. And I think it somewhat impacts how we view ourselves as well, especially for young kids. Tori doesn't agree. Tori thinks music is just music. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has a deeper impact than he does. I think it depends. See, this is what the issue is. And this is why we go at it, because we, when we think of black people in black music, we automatically think of rap. We don't talk about R&B. We don't talk about soul. We don't talk about blues. We don't talk about rock and roll literally back in the day. We talk about right. well, well the there's different forms of rap. All rap isn't trap music about selling drugs and, and shootings or whatever. And I think to me, there's, there's, there's guys like Wale out there. There's J. Cole. There are people that talk about things. And the beautiful thing to me about music, especially in the African-American community, that has always been a way to tell stories and mm -hmm. express feelings. And literally going back to Negro spirituals and slavery, like music has always been a form and a way for African-Americans to express themselves. So when I talk and I listen to rap music, I told Chanel, I'm like, 
some of my favorite songs are about dudes that are talking about grinding and being from the bottom. And yes, yeah. I talk about some crazy things on there, but it's like, you can relate to it because you know there's a struggle that they had to overcome. And mm-hmm. so to me, I've listened to a lot of music where dudes talk about selling drugs and mm-hmm. doing this and doing that. And I've literally never once thought that, hey, I'm trying to be the next, you know, kingpin out here. You know, to me, it was just music. So right. you have a lot of people in the comments who agree with you. Yeah, so, music can be influential. You know, music is basically music. And Tierra, uh, Tierra's comment, yeah. Yeah, Tierra's comment is, music is self-expression and experiences and why can't black people express themselves and their experiences? I don't have an issue with that. Um, I think it goes back to my insecurity of always feeling like we have to represent the whole race. And like, so when rappers, because a lot of rappers have a heavy white base fan base. And so I'm always worried that, and this is again, a part of this system that makes me feel like we have to represent the whole culture. And so when Lil Wayne goes on there and raps, he's representing all black people, whether we like it or not. And so um, with the lyrics and stuff like that, I, I just worry that they're gonna think that all black people are out here with guns and whatever. And it's really a, a really ignorant thought, but I think it happened. And in 2020, uh, if you go to a rap, well, ain't nobody going to a rap concert in 2020, but in 2019, if you went to a festival with rap or music, it was gonna be majority white kids are anyway. Like, so mm-hmm. rap music is something that crosses over and everyone loves to listen to, mm-hmm. but when they digest it, when they're not at the concert, when they're not in their car. It's a know, judgment. It's, it, there's a, some so good. are we reinforcing stereotypes? Are we reinforcing stereotypes and contributing to the racism and discrimination people have on us in society by, by um, supporting and listening to rap music. Now, it's our culture and we may love it, but what is it doing for us or to us? I think it's important to say certain types of rap music, right? Um, you know, when people are storytelling, talking about relationships, that's not the issue. You know, mm-hmm. we're talking about, a very we're specific. talking about when it comes to shooting and selling drugs and doing drugs, right? Um, which is a, a major issue now. But to me, I think, I mean, it's just, it's just music, you know? And, and obviously I'm saying it's just music and music is a powerful thing. Understanding that there are a lot of kids that they do that like for every meeting that where I say it doesn't bother me, I know there's someone out here that is feeling those lyrics and like, this is going to be me. Like, I want to do this. But, so Tori, those lyrics, those lyrics often include Ebonics, right? Yeah. So as a society, can we move past ideas associated with Ebonics being harmful or you know, uncivilized. Um, what do you think about that? I know Chanel, you said you had a story. It has to be. I was on LinkedIn today and I checked my message and someone said, hey, thanks for connecting with me. Big trust. <laughs> <laughs> Straight out of South Florida, made big trust a trend in corporate America, well, corporate Baltimore, right? But people, but white he's kids an and, exception to white, the white kids in private schools all over are, yell, are yelling big, big trust, trust, like and spelling it out. And everything like it's, it's cool only when, cool when white people make it cool. It's only a pro- I'm sorry, not cool. It's only appropriate when white people deem it appropriate because, as always, they determine the standard, the cultural standard. They determine what's professional. They determine what's accepted. They determine what's appropriate. And so, the minute that they like the music and they say the music, but let's be clear, them saying big trust. It's, 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 it's amazing every time I hear a white person say it, because I'm like, they're really to some degree accepting it, but they also talk about all the negative stuff. Like they're quick to point out the negative in the players and what they listen to and all their tattoos and all this. But when it's Lamar Jackson, who's winning games for them, MVP. it's okay. Mm-hmm. Big trust is okay to say just in that sense. And so I, it's always this constant battle between what do the white people accept from us and what don't they accept? Or what they consider to be civilized. He says civilization is often a polite euphemism for cultural racism. Mm -hmm. And I I told you I wanna bring up a concept called cultural humility. And that's really being like humble and respectful of someone else to teach you about their culture and not saying, oh, well, I learned about it. I read a book, 
You know, I read Ibram Kendi's How to Be Anti-Racist and now I understand, right? No, it's a lifelong process, right? It's an ongoing process for you to say, I, I'm ignorant, I don't know about your culture and it could be different, right? So it could be different for me as we were talking about food, right? It could be different for what we cook or what we do or what culture is to us. And so I can't say if I walk into your house, oh, I know because you know, I'm black and Tori and Chanel are black, so I understand. Like, yeah. I don't understand how you were raised within your culture the same way you wouldn't understand what my house looks like. So that's what cultural humility is. It's not about being culturally competent. It's about being humble to not understand. So even with, with rap and Ebonics, you need to understand from the context of who it's coming from. So mm -hmm. not everybody will speak like that. Not everybody will listen to that type of music, but it's just a piece of the culture. And I think too, when we think about black culture in general, I remember when we were planning TJ's, um, TJ school was having a cultural, a, like cultural awareness night. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a group of, there's a heavy um, population of Nigerian kids in his school. And so they had their own table set up and then like all these, everyone had their table sets up, set up. And then the black people were looking at each other like, we have to do something. And in talks of what black culture is to us, it was just so interesting because we were from different areas. We did have different experiences. So black culture is not just this one thing. And I think Kenny talks about New York versus the South and like mm -hmm. how different yeah. culture is depending on where you live. And I thought that was interesting. But one thing that remains constant to us is TJ goes to a predominantly white school. And so we're always like, we wanna make sure he knows who he is, he knows his culture. And it's like this constant fight that we want him to be, to remain true to who he is and who we are. Um, and so what does that look like in our household? How do we make sure that he understands his culture? Mm -hmm. um, and it's so important for us to make sure he's still around his people because I think kids can lose their culture a lot, especially if it's not present in their households. And so. And they're obviously not learning about it in school. Um, and That's so we so did our job to really teach it. And I think the bigger thing, in my opinion, um, she expressed it perfectly, which is a constant conversation in our, in our house, but being comfortable with your culture. Um, oftentimes, you know, what does is like, you look down on like, I listen to rap music. Oh, you listen to that? Oh, you have tattoos. Like, yeah. Black people aren't the only people with tattoos. Right. You know, like there are just certain things that stick out and I want him to be comfortable with no matter who he's around because we we have to adapt in so many different situations and mm -hmm. I never want that to take away from who he truly is inside. But when we talk about us wanting him to be who he is and whatever, we are really clear with him about the way he speaks. And so are we kind of going along with this idea that speaking very properly and enunciating and doing all these things and not using ebonics and slang, are, are we feeding into the idea that that's not professional and that's not accepted and that's less than by constantly correcting him or making sure he's able to speak quote unquote properly or when you're on your news station, you're, you have to change how you talk and the way you speak. Mm -hmm. Are we going along with this idea that, you know, our culture, our language, our way of talking is less than? Well, are you? Oh, so that, I mean, I'm not, and that's not a question. I'm just kind of being redundant, right? Yeah. So, uh, so you're not necessarily doing that because who's to say? Because that's another thing, right? People say, oh, if we talk proper, then we're trying to sound white. Mm -hmm. We is that, that's not necessarily true, yeah. right? We're just trying to sound proper. So why do we have to be labeled as trying to be always to that white standard? If we dress a certain way, you're dressing like you're white. If you yeah. straighten your hair, you want to look like you're more white. You know, if you talk a certain way, you sound white, right? I'm sure you've heard that before. So oh, why- I've, I've said it before. Here? I've absolutely, we've definitely, I was always the one who talked white in my family. And so, and I've definitely said that as a child, you sound white or you're acting like a white girl or that girl's trying to act black. Like we use that so much. And I think we're gonna get into that more with the behavior piece. What is acting black and what is mm -hmm. acting white? No one says you act Asian. It's always a black and white thing. So that's <laughs> interesting too. That's right. We're about to move on there right now. Let me give you guys the poll results. We have 53% said somewhat, 22% uh, said yes, and 25% wow. said not at all. So the that's majority very of people agree that rap music impacts the way they view black people and black culture. That mm -hmm. is really interesting. And I think that's really alarming because again, not all black people 
fit into this one category. Mm -hmm. Not all black people listen to rap music. Mm -hmm. Not all black people know anything about guns and violence. Some black people grew up. And we got, it's a very, again, I think it's important to know there's, it's a very specific type of rap music. We yeah. have to keep saying that because we put all this- Well, what's popular? Rap. What's what's the most popular rap music? I mean- Go to the top 100 list right now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, there's stuff on there, but I mean, that's, that's right. popular. Yes, it is, that's it is popular. popular. It's the sure. baby, right? <laughs> <laughs> baby. But it is like it's not the only source, which, but it's easy to lump it that way when the more popular songs are, you know, saying what they're saying. Right. So I'll end with this quote from this chapter as we move on. To be anti-racist is to see cultures and all their differences as on the same level as equals. When we see cultural differences, we see we are seeing cultural difference, nothing more, nothing less. How do you do that though? Like, how do you, it's easy to say we have to see cultures as equal, but I think we as people are so flawed that we do see someone, even just, even if there's like a religious difference in a culture or we're so quick to look down upon people like that's not something we do here in America. Like we're so quick to judge each other. And so I feel like, but who are we judging? I mean, often you, sometimes you see people say, oh, I don't like country music or look at that person, right? But are really just, you know, modern pop music, are people talking about Justin Timberlake and Justin Bieber, the way they're talking about rappers, right? We have to really examine that. And what is the stereotype? And what is the, like the difference between that when we're looking at that? So we just have to say different is just different. And we need to start looking at people like, just because you like a certain type of music or play a certain type of music, it doesn't make you lesser than or ignorant or uncivilized or any of those things. We just need to accept differences as part of American culture. And, and I just want to quickly say, there are some horrible rappers who are just rapping about stuff to rap about it. And they're trash. I'm on your team, Chanel. I'm like, I'm not a big Listen to some of it. Like, I, I, I'm all cool with it. I acknowledge the art and the creativity of the folks who made the beats. I don't really pay attention to the elementary rhymes sometimes, but <laughs> I mean, if it's catchy, it's catchy, and I'm playing it. Yeah. <laughs> my son, my son is, 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 he likes, he loves music, so he's always having me listen to something. So, uh, okay, getting into the next chapter, which is again on behavior, uh, the quote is, Every time someone racializes behavior, describes something as quote unquote black behavior, they're expressing a racist idea. To be anti-racist is to recognize that there's no such thing as racial behavior. We are guilty of the acting black, acting white thing. Why is it so harm harmful if there's no black gene? There's, I mean, we're all guilty of racializing behavior. Um, the only difference is I feel like for black people, the things that, the behaviors that we get racial, racialized are, are like dangerous. Um, when you think we went back to stereotypes and what do we think it means to act Asian or like Asians are good at math? Like, what do we say about white people? And I think, I think it's really interesting because in 2020, I think white people are getting a little taste of what we go through because right now, you're like on arm to prove you're not racist. Like right now, white people have a bad rap. Like white people are racist right now. That's what people are, are thinking. And so white people are constantly having to prove I'm not racist, I'm not racist, I'm not racist. Just like we have to prove every day that we're educated, that we're not dangerous, that we're not violent, that we're not, you know, all these negative stereotypes. And I think people can get a little taste of feeling that burden of, having to represent your entire race. Like it's such a heavy burden to always be thinking about, crap, I have to do really well at this job so that they understand that black people are qualified or we have to do really good in school so they understand that black kids are smart too. Like it's a, I'm raising TJ and my kids to be great because I'm like, we need them to know that black people are great and we're gonna prove to you. It's like, you're always having to prove and it's, it's a heavy burden to have to do that. Now, I actually said something to some to someone this morning about that online because there was a police uh, Blue Lives Matter um, walk in the area where I went to high school. And it's a thousand or so people. And I was honestly disgusted by it because of the timing of it. And to me, it was like an eye opener. Like, well, people are going to defend the good officers, which we all should always protect good officers, right? 
But people confuse being anti-bad cop with being anti-police. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. the few, they're feeling the pressure of the bad officers are making it seem like everyone's bad. Well, guess what? When you see criminals or people who made mistakes who look black on TV, it makes it seem like every black person is bad. And right. so for people to kind of see it, you we're able to see like people aren't used to being in that position, but honestly, it's the black experience. I really, I think I'm really struggling just even now thinking about when I when I read about that burden of having to represent your whole race and having to be great. I think he put something in there like, I'm gonna say the quote. <laughs> be exceptional. They have to be just to right. survive. We have to be exceptional. And looking at every day, how much we really do. I think if anything that I could tell people today is like our experiences, things that we say, it may seem like we're making more than it than it is, but like it's heavy on my heart every time I think about how much I have to do with my kids to make sure that they're looked at as equal. Right. Um, and that, and I'm, I, I'm really starting to struggle with that. Like I go through moments where it makes me really upset because people do view black people in general a certain way. And unless we're out here proven, like, and I, like even Tori and I feel like we have such a heavy burden to like never mess up. I told Tori, like, if he ever cheats on me and we get a divorce, like we mess up everything. Like we have to represent black love. We have to represent that we can have healthy relationships and that black people in great relationships with or without marriage, are, they do exist. They're great parents They're And I feel like that's something that is such a burden that is like almost unbearable sometimes. It is. And he goes into it. He says, one of racism's harms is the way it falls on the unexceptional black person who's asked to be extraordinary, as you said, just to survive. He says, and even worse, the black screw up who faces the abyss after one error while the white screw up is handed second chances and empathy. And I can say again and again, even though that that's not there because if they're always given grace. And I say they, because they, the white standard, the white race is given grace. Whereas if we make one mistake, then that's what we're known for. We could do a thousand things of greatness and one mistake. And that's one what we're yeah, one, mistake. one mistake. Yeah, and I think not to make it political, but we're seeing that with the way the past two, pre- well, the past two presidents have been treated. You know, yeah. and, and a, oh if you gosh. ever have a general conversation with someone who supports um, Donald Trump, like it's frustrating to me, not because of like who I, I like policies, all that you vote for, you vote for whatever. I don't hate people because they vote for the guy, but when you hold this guy to a higher standard or a low, like he's able to get you hold athletes and entertainers to higher standards yeah. than than, you, than the leader of the free world. And so to me, like, it's interesting. I just remember President Obama getting destroyed for Anything. people questioning where he was born, for wearing a, yeah. light, for wearing a light suit, mm-hmm. for wearing a light suit. Like, there was never a question of who the, the individual was, but it's almost like the same line we continue to say. You have to work twice as hard yeah. just to be accepted. And even then, it still isn't enough. And even then, he's not even there and still gets attacked. So... I mean, it, it's crazy to me. And I think that too- Michelle Obama, right? The way she dressed, the, anything that she did, you know? And I think, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, that's why I think when I think about rap music and rappers, like they, rappers, athletes are some of the most popular black people in the United States. And so it sucks, but like they do represent us. They represent us as, as an entire race. And so- when an athlete does something, it's on the news and millions of people are watching and, and judging. And, and that depiction of the black athlete gets placed on all black people. And so black celebrities, whether they like it or not, they're representing us. And so any little mistake that they make, it goes, you know, it gets, it gets uh, applied to all of us. And I was talking to Tori, we talk about when there's crime or something on the news, something like big and major where we literally, I literally pray that they're not black. Like, please don't be black. Please don't be black. And we're all like silently thinking that like, we hope it's not black. And then it comes out that they're not black. And we're like, Oh my gosh, thank God. Because that one person doing something will be, you know, 
it's going to taint the black race as a whole. And we don't do that for white people. There's a, there's a shooting, a mass shooting. No one's looking at white people in general as these bad people off of that one person. Right. And so it's really, it's really tough all around to live the black experience and always having to be on point, be perfect and work twice as hard and teach your, make sure your kids know who they are and like do fight all these stereotypes. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's a whole lot of work. Um, with, less, for, less resources, right? with less resources. So we had a conversation the other day talking about education. He gets into standardized testing. They go into eugenics and how the SAT was created yeah. and you know, it's really unfair. And we have, you know, um, students, particularly white and Asian students who have access to tutors to all these high end, you know, prep courses. Um, but then we have people in the inner city that may be just as smart, but then the schools are also graded, right? So tell me a little bit about your experience with the testing as an I, educator. I sucked at the SAT, first of all. But um, <laughs> I, can do, I know we were actually blessed to be in school systems that offer classes and that we were able to get, you know, help with applying to those courses and stuff like that. So we were, we were in a blessed position in that way. Um, but 100%, I remember when I took the SAT, I'm a very smart individual and just like the way the questions were worded and all of that like could really throw you off and overwhelm you. And I remember in one section of the SAT, I was just like, let me just guess. Like I didn't even wanna, it was too much on my mind to try to figure out what the question was even asking. Why is it that hard if you're trying to test how knowledgeable I am of something, why are you making the question so ridiculously hard for me to even understand? And so going back to that, when you take these SAT courses, they're teaching you how to take the test. You're not right. any smarter. They're just giving you strategies. Right. And so about that, right? it's a horrible. And I was a third, fourth grade teacher. I remember the whole year, my class was doing amazing. Like I always had the lower level kids and my kids were flourishing. And then we get to the SAT, I mean, the SAT, the standardized testing time, springtime. And it's like, we just threw all that away. And now I'm literally teaching them how to take this test for months. And it was like the most ridiculous thing in the world. But again, we got judged if those kids didn't score well, they didn't score high enough. And so we stressed out so much on making these kids ready for this one test that would be a judgment of my teaching of their whole school experience in our school in general. And that's really unfair. Absolutely. So he says to be anti-racist, we need to stop supporting mechanisms rooted in racist ideas like the standardized testing, you know, for racial groups. And then to end this section, he says to be anti-racist is to de-racialize behavior and to remove the tattoo stereotype from every racialized body. Behavior is something humans do, not racists do. That's so gonna, the hardest thing to do. It is. <laughs> People as individuals and not representing an entire race is but I, I like that imagery of he's talking about having a tattooed stereotype because it is something that we feel like we can't remove right unless you go get it lasered off like I see Tori you have a lot of tattoos and how would you like to be like you know labeled based on based on that so it, uh, it, it happens I've been in conversation with people so my tattoos as of today <laughs> Stop right here. So if I'm, I'm I'm wearing a polo, you don't really see it. It's not going to be that way for long. But it's like that now, right? It's been that way for years. And I was with a guy that was in a corporate space and I had a polo. And he was like, wow, man, I'm really surprised. Like, you know, you're very well spoken and, you know, you don't have all the tattoos like these other guys. And wow. I was like, right. Like, <laughs> tattoos, like, it's just not where you see them because I was taught early that your tattoos can impact, can keep you from getting a job. Mm -hmm. Right. Try not to do it. Um, yeah, I once had a client with tattoos over his whole entire face, barely 19 years old. I mean, even on his eyelids, you know, 19 years old, had been in jail three times for gun charges. And I thought to myself, did anybody not talk to you about what this is going to do for the rest of your life? Like, even if you completely change your life around that, again, you're stereotyped based on your tattoos. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're going to get into our last topic. We have about 10 minutes left. So for slide, <laughs> for the next slide, we're going to talk about colorism. So color, colorism, it says, is like all forms of racism, and it rationalizes inequities with racist ideas, claiming the inequities between dark people and light people 
are not due to racist policy, but are based in what is wrong or right with each group of people. So it's really kind of internalized racism. What do you think about that, Chanel? I mean, we, it was, it, it's, it's alive and well. Colorism 100% exists. And I found myself because I'm light skinned, I think I'm more in the middle, but people would consider me light skinned. Um, I was even talking to my best friend who was dark skinned and talking about when we grew up, how tough it was, like all the music we listened to was about red bones and you had to be light skinned with long hair and all those things. And I even said to her, like, I really think that's changing. And I had to check myself because I, it was kind of like when white people say to us, like racism doesn't exist, like that used to be. And she was like, looked at me like, it absolutely still exists. Like, I still feel the same way. Mm -hmm. And I, for a moment, I had to stop. Like, I was in a privileged position to, to be able to say, oh, that doesn't exist anymore. And that we're more accepting of dark skinned girls and dark skinned guys and stuff like that. And she pretty much told me like, she still feels that every day. Um, and it just took me back to like, when we have kids, the first thing black people say to me or talk to us about is what color our kids are. Like, oh, he's, that's, he's such a chocolate baby or, oh, she's so light, she looks like you. And like, skin color is always a constant conversation. Mm. Um, and it's that we're feeling like the lighter you are, the better you are. And obviously the lighter you are, the closer to white you are. And so that correlation between light and dark is definitely alive and well. And I was on her side in the argument that Chanel was tripping. Like yeah. It very much exists. I mean, uh, for dark skinned women, you know, I know plenty of them coming up, uh, like her friend who were told they were pretty, they were pretty, pretty for a black, black girl. girl. They always say pretty that. for a black girl. Yep. Pretty for a black girl. And I know myself, whether uh, even within my own race, you know, I got talked about with the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. You know, being dark, being like when, when people are from Africa and they were in our schools, like li I'm talking literally from Africa, they were made fun of for their skin mm -hmm. and the way they look and their features that we all shared. So mm -hmm. um, to me, it's something that is very much alive and well. And in the black community, I say it all the time, we're fighting multiple battles and it's exhausting. I'm not even gonna lie, like, it's exhausting when you're dealing with these things. It's exhausting when, when, when you're talking about literally your skin color um, you know, and talking about our boys directly, like we have a whole spectrum of kids. They have, they're three different. Yeah. <laughs> like, but they're, even they're then, different. like we literally, I even remember growing up, everyone needed to have their claim to white. So like my grandmother is white. And so everyone was like, well, Chanel, you're, you're a quarter white. It was like this big deal that I was a quarter white. And, or my family has Indian in them. It was like anything that we could do to be less black and more of color was the thing to do. And that's, it's clearly a deeply rooted thing. Well, it goes into the, 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 the one drop rule, the two drop rule and the three drop rule, right? So it's like, you know, why were these rules put in place or that, you know, if you're three eighths this and you're this 33% this, then you're this. So it's interesting because I think we were talking about this the other day that when um, they decided to bring slaves over here from Africa, that in England, you were what your father was. Mm -hmm. But because they didn't want the children of the slaves that were being raped by the masters to be considered white, then they said, no, we're going to change it. You are what your mother is. Wow. You know, but what's, so I'm going to say this to say, what about Barack Obama? If that's the rule, why isn't he white? Mm -hmm. Because you are what your mother is based on, based on those things. So it's like, we, we choose to label people as it fits for us, right? Because we're always trying to like put somebody in a box but why do people have to be placed in a box? So if people are mixed with anything, if they're half Mexican and half black, half Japanese, half black, no matter what they're mixed with, they're black. But if they're half Japanese and white or Mexican and white, they'll say I'm white, you know, it's, right? I think it's really interesting to, like Tori said, we're fighting so many battles. So we're fighting for black people to, be, I mean, for white people to view us as equal. And then we're fighting within our own race yeah, we're fighting each other all equal and so it's a it's a hot mess it really you know you don't want to seem like even beyond your skin color we're going backwards a little bit but even when you're talking about the way you, you speak or you present yourself it's like when you're around your people you don't want to be too like white you call it too white right or and then on the other side you don't you like when a, if you're in a professional environment or around white people you don't want to come off as 
you know, let your Ebonics or whatever come out. That's my thing. And so to me, it's a it's a tough battle because like it's almost like it's never good enough no matter where you are. Yeah. You know, you can't you can never truly be yourself or even be what you want to be because you're always going to be judged. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we place a lot of focus on skin color. You know, you're absolutely right about that. And just looking at like and it gets to the point where we have this self-hatred. Whereas, you know, you have people who are dark that are using those skin lightening creams, getting rashes. I was looking on the internet over the last week and just looking at the damage people do to themselves just to try to get to this white standard. But there's also something that I found very interesting and it was called black fishing. Have you guys heard of black fishing? Mm -hmm. This was crazy. These are white people who are trying to make themselves look black those all jobs like as models and stuff and so you should look it up on instagram <laughs> i was shocked i was like what is this black fishing yes yeah, so it was really interesting so i thought okay you have people who are making it okay to be black because they do like kim kardashian coloring her hair or braiding it or trying to like you know have some of the attributes that <laughs> that you know that we have right so that's okay for people to do that but not the other way around Right. So there's a lot of, you know, issues with the with the black race. I know. Yeah, I think I think it's so black men get the whole, you know, they're feared, they're dangerous, they're aggressive. And I know as a black woman growing up feeling like, yes, absolutely. You don't look a certain way. Your own black men won't even like you. And like you have to look more white, have straight hair, have this, have that to be accepted by the black man. And so we're yeah, like you said, we're dealing with all these different battles all these different battles were continuously on a battlefield and so it's hard to navigate sometimes um especially with raising kids just thinking about who we want tj to be who we want cam to be who we want Corey to be um and how that how that carries out hopefully they'll be living in an anti-racist society in 20 years let's hope <laughs> let's hope we get there with a, a that will be closer at least but um yeah it's a yeah like you said like joseph said the dual in consciousness Exactly. exactly. So, so for this, for this, we'll end this conversation, even though it's really good, we could go on probably for hours, but <laughs> we'll say this, to be anti-racist is not to reverse the beauty standard. To be anti-racist is to eliminate any beauty standard based on skin and eye color, hair texture, facial and bodily features shared by groups. To be anti-racist is to diversify our standards of beauty, like our standards of culture and intelligence to see beauty equally in all skin colors, broad or thin noses, kinky and straight hair, light and dark eyes. To be anti-racist is to build and to live in a beauty culture that accentuates instead of erases our natural beauty. I know it sounds like this fantasy. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It, yeah, it's tough. So our ending quote's gonna be, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Miss Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Chanel, do you want to go over the homework this week or do you want me to do it? Sure, I can, I can go over it. Homework this week. First of all, we're reading chapters 10 through 13. Yes, ma'am. Um, and our reflection questions are, the first one is, how can you practice seeing all cultures as equal? How can you recognize and stop the urge to focus on, only on the negative aspects of any community? And I think these type of homework questions are super important because they're actionable things and things that we can actually think about um, when we're evaluating our lives. Um, and so that's an important one. The next one is come up with the three worst racialized behaviors you can think of. Take a moment to reflect on what it would be like to be born into those expectations. And I think that goes back to that piece on empathy and being able to, even though you're not in the situation, being able to say, you know, how would I feel if every day I woke up, I had to fight the stereotype of being dangerous and uneducated and, and aggressive. Um, so think about that. What behavior have you racialized and how can you go about addressing it? So think about the things that you have racialized do you have things in your head that you think black, all black people do or all white people do, all Asian people do? And then the last one, Kendi continues to highlight the differences between assimilationists and anti-racist. Can you explain the assimilationist perspective and recognize why it is problematic? 
So I, we put that one in because in every chapter, I feel like he tells you like the segregationists do this, mm-hmm. the assimilationists. Yep, he does. <laughs> a lot of us fall into the assimilationist perspective. Like we, right. like we know people can change. We just got to change them and, and give them the resources and give them the tools and then they'll be okay. And so he really highlights how that, that way of thinking is really pro- problematic and that we have to shift that thinking between feeling like we have to change people. Um, but think about all those things. And then, so next week we'll meet chapters 10 through 13 and then we're almost done the book. Yeah. Yeah. Are you liking the book so far, Ramona? I I like it. I get a little eh, on some of the definitions, all the breakdowns, but I think next week we're going to get into black and white. So that'll be really interesting. It's a really good discussion. So I've already started making some notes and I know you have too. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to talk about next week. Yes. Any final thoughts? Yeah, along the lines of what you just said. With the book. <laughs> I have to realize this book is written by a man, right? He's not perfect either. So yeah. we're all going on this journey together. But he's kind of gave us a blueprint and a guideline to, to get us to where we are right now, discussing it and trying to engage and communicate in a way that we're kind of talking the same language. So I for sure appreciate him for this book and I'm enjoying, you know, having this conversation and uh, debating with my wife on other subjects. My, um, my, well, our professor who actually passed away, he was an amazing man, Jonathan Jonathan England. Um, he was our African American studies teacher on campus and he was, he was such a dope soul. But, um, when we were talking about what book to read, I told him about this book and he was like, yeah, it's a little fluffy, but it may be a good start. So, we're starting here and hopefully we can read some some other books too. Because you can't just take one book and say, oh, this is the Bible. Right. Um, it's always learning important. Experience. Yeah, it's so, always important to read multiple books and get different perspectives and then come to the conclusion on your own. So yep. So we'll see you guys next week. And uh that's it, right? That's it. That's it. Bye Thank guys. You. Wear your mask. Oh yes, wear your mask. <laughs>